Did you notice the shepherd in the season finale of season three of The Chosen? I mean, she's only there for a brief moment. And yet this shepherd is actually the key to understanding the deeper meaning of this episode. In the season finale, we see Jesus teaching parables to a diverse and hostile crowd. We witness him feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And we see him walk on water in the midst of a violent storm. And yet all of this, along with the many feelings and struggles that his followers are facing, are all brought together through the significance of this shepherd. Want to know how and understand the deeper meaning of all of this? Well, then join me for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now, before we dive in, let me take a quick moment to thank the sponsor of today's video, Angel Studios. And if you're not familiar with Angel Studios, they're the studio who brought you The Chosen. Angel Studios' mission is to tell stories that amplify light and make the kind of movies and shows that families really want to watch, not just the ones that Hollywood chooses. That mission started with The Chosen and is growing to include many other shows like The Wing Feather Saga, The Tuttle Twins, and Testament, a really amazing modern interpretation of the Book of Acts. I was actually just watching the Testament movie recently and I'm really excited to see where this show goes. Their depiction of the parable of the Good Samaritan is one of my favorites. You see, what many people don't realize about the parable of the Good Samaritan is how ironic it is. Jews and Samaritans hated one another. When Jesus told his audience that a Samaritan stopped to help a Jew, not priests and Levites, and that the point of this parable was that the Samaritan was the type of person he was referring to when he said, love your neighbor as yourself, his audience would have been shocked. Well, Testament reimagines this parable in a powerful way, highlighting two groups who are relevant in our world today, two groups whose hate we would clearly understand. And you'll totally understand what I mean when you watch it. I don't want to spoil it for you, so make sure you download the Angel app and check out Testament. The app is free to download and works on all major streaming devices. You'll find a link down in the description and up in the card where you can download that app. And right now, let's dive into our video. Now, before we can understand the significance of the shepherd, we first have to understand the setup, the problem that Jesus' disciples are facing throughout this episode. If you remember, as episode 7 ended, there was tension and turmoil surrounding Jesus and his disciples as they faced a diverse crowd in the Decapolis. And yet, for some reason, Jesus seemed to welcome it. In fact, as episode 8 begins, Jesus addresses the crowd and actually tells them that it's okay for them to argue while he's teaching. Now, this might seem surprising to us, but it actually reveals something important about learning and education in the Jewish community at the time of Jesus. When I say learning and education, I'm not talking about things like language arts, social studies, math, and sciences. When we talk about learning in the Jewish community, we almost always mean spiritual education. You see, Jewish boys wouldn't go to school to get a liberal arts education. They would go to learn Torah. And in Torah study, question and answer was the foundation for education. I mean, Jesus even says it himself. It's customary for Jewish teachers to ask questions. The importance of questions and answers of this interactive form of learning extends beyond situations like the one unfolding in the field of the Decapolis. This was how the Jewish community worshipped every week. At a typical synagogue service, you would cleanse yourself in the mikvah, then you would find your appropriate place in the room. If you were important and prominent, you might sit in the chief seats, but for most people, you would find a space around the periphery. Then, after everyone had taken their place, a person from within the community would be asked to lead the service for that day. Now, sometimes it was a visiting rabbi or the rabbi from that community, but other times it was simply a person from within that community. It was absolutely normal for lay persons to lead the service in this way. This person in charge would receive the scroll for that day from the Torah closet, and then they would stand on something called the Bema as they read it. The scripture that he would read would have been predetermined, part of a lectionary, and once he finished reading, he would sit in a chair called the Moses seat to share his thoughts on that scripture. And then after he finished, there would be time for the congregation to question and discuss. As you can see, it was a service centered around the community. Unlike today, where we have a religious leader or a professional stand up and speak at length, telling us what the scripture means. In the synagogue, the answers came from within the community. 
The leader that day would share his perspective, but then there was conversation, even argument, as the community explored that text together. Jesus wants this interaction with his engagement with this crowd, right? Because if all we ever do is just listen, if we just consume and don't respond, well, we can find ourselves in a dangerous situation. One that Jesus' own disciples find themselves in in this episode. You see, as Jesus is teaching this crowd, he makes another interesting comment. Jesus mildly rebukes his disciples by declaring that they are quick to forget what they've seen and learned. It's not that they don't believe in Jesus, but they have a hard time carrying that belief from one instance to the next. And this is something that appears even more powerfully in the Gospels. While I love that the Chosen has helped us to imagine the feeding of the 5,000, this significant moment in Jesus' ministry by putting it on the big screen, we lose something when we pull this away from the biblical text itself. Because as Jesus feeds these multitudes, something very significant is happening with his disciples. You see, both Matthew and Mark's Gospels depict the story of the feeding of the 5,000 basically as we see it in this episode from The Chosen. Right? Jesus is teaching a large crowd, and then suddenly it's dinner time. Right, So the disciples tell Jesus to send the people to get some food, but Jesus says, you feed them. And the disciples respond with, well, how are we going to do that? Right, We don't have enough bread or fish. And so Jesus takes a few loaves and fish and feeds 5,000 people. But this is where things begin to get interesting, because both of these gospels, Matthew and Mark, Follow up the story of the feeding of the 5,000 with another story, the feeding of the 4,000. In this story, once again, Jesus has a huge crowd listening to him. And once again, dinner time arrives and the disciples say that he needs to send the people away to get some food. And you want to guess what he says back? He says, you feed them. And guess how they respond? We don't have enough bread or fish. Right? Wouldn't you just love to see Jesus' face in that moment? I mean, they just saw him do this sort of thing, but they still can't believe it. Nevertheless, once again, Jesus takes a few loaves and fish and feeds this massive crowd. But here's where things get even more interesting. Many people try to say that these two feedings are maybe the same feeding. But if you look closer at scripture, you realize that this just isn't a good theory. The details of these stories seem very specific and intentional. And there's something else that happens after them, another feeding that proves to us that all of these are separate, important events. And the additional feeding is what I like to call the feeding of the 12. You see, right after the feeding of the 4,000, Jesus gets back into the boat with his disciples, and they begin to go back across the Sea of Galilee. And guess what they start talking about? They start discussing that they have no bread. And so Jesus unleashes on them. He says, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? The problem for the disciples isn't necessarily that they don't believe in Jesus. It's that they forget. And their forgetfulness leads to doubt and their doubt stalls their faith which is where another one of the parables that Jesus teaches in this episode becomes so important. You see, after Jesus makes room for the throngs of people who come to hear him, he tells the parable of the sower and the seed. And this is a parable that would have been especially relevant to them simply because of where they were. You see, when I was in the Holy Land, we had a special opportunity to walk a path that Jesus would have walked, a trail from Chorazim to Capernaum. And as we started off on this trail, it was exactly what I was hoping for, right? A smooth trail to walk on, a beautiful day for walking, a clear view of the Sea of Galilee. But then suddenly everything changed. While the trail was labeled as a national trail, only a portion of it had been blazed. And we didn't reach the unblazed portion until after we passed through a one-way gate. We were stuck. And for the next two and a half hours, we hiked our way through tall grass and thistles. Every few steps led us through a patch of thorns. We tripped over rocks and stumbled through the grass. And yet, as we hiked this trail, I began to realize something. We began our trail on a path. 
flat and pressed down by hundreds of footsteps. We descended rocky hills down into a flat wadi where we completed most of our hike. And in that wadi, we encountered many, many thorns. As I made this journey, I would look out upon the surrounding area and realize that the rest of the landscape around me was the same as where I was walking. It looked beautiful from a distance, but up close, it was filled with rocks and brush and thorns. Few were the areas where one would find good soil, where crops would actually grow. And suddenly, I saw the parable of the sower and the seed from the perspective of Jesus' audience. As they heard him teach, they would have gazed out over the surrounding area. They would have remembered the moments where they were stabbed by thistles and thorns or stubbed their toes on the surrounding rocks. They would have naturally understood how unique and powerful good soil is. The land spoke to the story and the story spoke to the land. This is what that crowd was not just imagining, but seeing as they sat there listening to this parable. They knew what he meant when he talked about rocks and thorns and paths. They knew how precious good soil was. Then there was something else that Jesus said that made all of this reverberate even more deeply. As Jesus finishes this parable, he says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Now to our English speaking ear, it merely sounds like Jesus is saying, listen up. But to a Hebrew speaker, to Jesus's Jewish audience, these words mean something more. Because in Hebrew, the word that means to hear is the word Shema. But Shema doesn't just mean to hear or listen, it also means obey. You see, in Hebrew, words don't just describe action, they also describe outcome. It's not enough just to hear God's words or to listen to them. The key is what you do with them, the outcome. You have to obey them. Which brings us at last to the shepherd. Because up until now, what we've been seeing is the problem that the disciples are facing throughout this episode. They hear, but they struggle to obey. They argue with Jesus. And in the shepherd, we begin to see what will change all of that. Now, the first thing that you may have noticed about the shepherd is that she's female, right? Often we imagine shepherds, like at the birth of Jesus, for instance, as men. But the reality is that it was incredibly common for women to be shepherds. In the Old Testament, Jacob's wife, Rachel, was a shepherd. And this is because shepherding was a lowly task. It was necessary, but not highly respected. So if there were daughters in a family, they would be put in charge of tending to the sheep while the men went and did more important work. But the other thing you might have noticed about the shepherd, and this is even more important, is that she is in Judea, a region that is filled with desert. And that's because, contrary to what we might think, sheep are primarily kept in the desert in Israel. And Jesus's audience in Galilee would have understood why. Remember, Jesus is speaking to an agrarian audience, people who farm and tend the land. He's just told them a parable about planting crops. And one thing that farmers would know is that sheep need to be kept far away from crops. Sheep will eat and eat and eat until a shepherd forces them to stop eating. They will eviscerate a crop. So instead, sheep were primarily kept in the desert, which gives King David's 23rd Psalm an entirely new look. You see, King David wasn't just a king. He grew up as a shepherd. And David didn't just listen to Psalms. He wrote them. And the 23rd Psalm is filled with his memories of his life as a shepherd. He remembers the desert land where he guided his sheep. And he remembers the details that are lost on most of us, like how green pastures in Judea aren't endless fields of lush grass. They're patches of grass along the side of a mountain, not enough for the sheep to glutton themselves on, just enough for today. And the paths of righteousness that he talks about aren't spiritual practices like we tend to imagine. They're literal paths on the side of the mountain. Shepherds will lead their sheep along the paths of righteousness. The mountains themselves are jagged and dangerous, but the paths are smooth and straight. And as the sheep walk along these paths, they don't actually watch where they're going. Instead, they graze on the green pastures, the tufts of vegetation on the side of the mountain, and they follow their shepherd's voice. This is why the shepherd is so important, because this is the answer to the problem the disciples are facing. 
They see what Jesus is doing, but they're following other voices, the voices of doubt inside of their minds, the voices of their past that tell them this is how you should respond and this is what you should think. But the true answer to what they're going through, the one thing that they truly need to do is to follow the voice of their shepherd, which in the end is exactly what some of them do. For the last few episodes, Simon and Eden have been hurting. They have suffered a loss, and they are lost. They don't know how to handle their grief. They don't know what to do with their anger. And they don't know what to do about Jesus, how Jesus fits into all of this. But then something amazing begins to unfold. As Eden is sitting alongside Salome and Mary Magdalene, at a loss for how to deal with her grief and anger, Mary tells her to go to synagogue, but then she makes a very important clarification. She tells Eden that synagogue is not about the words that the rabbi gives. It's about the word of God. It's not some important oration or spiritual platitude that's going to heal her. Her hope is not to be found in the voice of a friend or a leader. Her hope is in the word of God. She just needs to follow the voice of her shepherd. And so does Simon. When Eden goes to the synagogue, when Simon gets out of the boat, this is what they're doing. Their faith is in the word. She is seeking the word of God, and he is following the word made flesh. But they don't just hear the word, they obey. Eden enters that water as an act of faith, trusting that God's word is true, that she can be healed of this pain. Simon enters the water in response to Jesus' command, trusting that the word is true, that he will be saved. They are following the voice of their shepherd, trusting that only he can lead them on the path of righteousness, the safe path that will guide them through the valley of the shadow of death that they've been experiencing. For so long they believed, and now they must obey, take a step into the unknown, trusting that the voice of the Lord will carry them through. If you've ever been in a place of pain, you might know what I'm talking about. Or or maybe you're in a place of pain right now, a place of loss, a place of confusion, a place of despair, one of those places where you feel like you are surrounded by darkness and you can't find your way out. Well, here's what I want you to know today. Your shepherd is calling to you. Follow his voice. Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. They shema it. They listen to it. They hear it. They obey it. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus is saying, come to me, you who are weary and broken. Follow the voice of your shepherd. Trust me. Obey me. Give your heart to me and no one will snatch you away from me. This is the powerful message that we see in this episode. It's the message of the gospel, and it's the message that I want you to hear today. May you listen to your shepherd. May you follow his voice. May he lead you through your pain. And may you know the hope and the healing that we can only find through our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Well, that's it for this episode of The Chosen Explained. Now make sure to download the Angel Studios app so that you can go back and check out all the scenes that I just highlighted. You'll find a link up here and down in the description. And if you're interested in seeing more of my videos on each episode of The Chosen, just click this link right here. Thank you so much for watching today. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.